Chapter 7. The Cosmos of Knowledge In origin, the various sciences grew from practical experience, from the art of healing, from surveying, from the workshops of builder and painter, from navigation. The unity of science is a philosophical idea. In practice, the philosophical ideal of unity became the search for a single organic body of knowledge. So began the cooperation of all branches of learning toward a common goal. Practical instruction, dating back to time immemorial, is concerned not with the whole or the purity of knowledge, but only with the particular skill required for a particular occupation. By contrast, scientific instruction in accordance with the ideal of the university seeks to guide us to the foundations of all knowledge by the light of the idea of unity. It encourages a particular skill to uncover those roots which join it to the single whole of science so that its deeper meaning and full range may become apparent. The university must always meet the needs of the practical occupations. In this respect, it resembles the ancient training schools, but it adds something totally new when it meets these needs by way of defining their place within the whole of knowledge. Thus, from one point of view, the university resembles an aggregate of professional training schools isolated from one another, or an intellectual department store with an abundance of goods for every taste. But from another point of view, it is clear that this is mere appearance alone. This is mere appearance, since if true, the university would simply disintegrate. The very existence of the university stands for that oneness and wholeness of all knowledge, which alone enables us to know in the broader sense of the term. The wholeness of knowledge, however, presents us with the task of classifying all knowledge. The departmental divisions appear to, but do not in fact coincide with, this classification. Though they can never really coincide, they must be related to one another. The course catalog of any large university will suffice as a first guide to the kinds of different subjects in existence. We find that the university is divided into faculties, and these in turn into departments divided by subject in almost endless variety. Clearly, the course catalog as a whole is the product not of a master plan, but of a slow process of historical accretion. The classification of knowledge. Since the idea of knowledge as a cosmos does not stem from practical application but from philosophy, its vitality is tied to the diffusion of philosophical awareness throughout the university. From the very start, the idea of knowledge as a unity has given rise to different systems of classifying the various fields of knowledge. Classifications abound. None of them, however, can claim absolute truth and validity. Definite classifications have always reflected someone's proud conviction of having hit upon the whole and absolute truth of things. As absolute truths indefinitely formulated here and now have succeeded one another, the necessary relativity of all systems of classification has become increasingly clear. Our faculty of understanding has been emancipated. The educational power of knowledge has ceased to be identical with a fixed world outlook and ontology. It is replaced by our realization that our capacity for learning new things is infinite. To assume that one has the one final and correct classification of studies is to pretend that a given field of knowledge can be defined and localized with the help of certain fixed absolute points. Conversely, to attempt to relate a given field to the whole of knowledge involves pushing inquiry to those depths where the field appears as a microcosmic replica of the whole of knowledge. For there is almost no significant fact which is not at some point related to the whole of knowledge in that it is either illumined by its context or itself in turn illumines that context. Knowledge is usually classified according to some pair of opposites. Thus, there are one, theoretical and practical studies. Theoretical studies are concerned with a given subject as an end in itself. Practical studies are concerned with the subject as a means toward the realization of practical ends. Two, empirical sciences and purely rational sciences. Empirical sciences deal with real objects in space and time. Pure sciences deal with concepts which are intelligible once they can be independently derived. Mathematics is unique among the sciences in that it deals solely with ideal objects. 3. Natural sciences and cultural sciences. The object of empirical sciences can be grasped in two ways. It can be grasped from without, like matter, or understood from within, like the human mind. The natural sciences explain things from without through laws of causation or mathematical constructs. The cultural sciences or humanities understand from within by ascertaining purpose and meaning. 4. Sciences concerned with general laws and historical sciences. The former seeking the universal, 
the latter, the particular, and historically unique. 5. Basic Sciences and Auxiliary Sciences Basic sciences seek to learn by reference to the whole of knowledge, hence become representatives of the whole and therefore universal in character. Auxiliary sciences either collect material or assemble knowledge for a particular practical purpose. In each of these pairs, the opposing principles of scientific understanding complement one another. They can briefly isolate themselves, for in isolation each becomes sterile. In practice, each pair of opposites asserts itself simultaneously, there being no way of dividing them neatly and permanently into opposites. The concrete sciences are united only by the object which they seek to approximate with every method at their disposal. They no more fit into a fixed classification scheme than do the widening and intersecting circles caused by pebbles tossed into a pool. But then these widening circles may conceivably be classified according to the relative nature and position of the pebbles involved. Thus, sciences may be ranked in the order of their intrinsic priority, where each level depends on the next lower one, as in the order of physics, chemistry, psychology, sociology. This would be a series of sciences seeking the universal, or cosmic history, world history, life history, human history, European history. This would be a series of studies concerned with what is unique and individual. Whatever our system of classification, it is always predicated on a single pair of opposites, and to that extent, not all-inclusive. Further examination would show that such schemes can never illumine more than single occurrences, and imperfectly at that. That genuine classification is attainable. At best, a given scheme has pragmatic relevance to a specific area of actual research. Usually, the unity of any given scheme is furnished by the particular science which this scheme favors. There is good reason for the fact that almost every science has at one time or another declared itself the only genuine, all-inclusive, and absolute science. The reason is that every true science constitutes a single whole. Error ensues only when the wholeness of one science is allowed to obscure the equally autonomous wholeness of other sciences. One-sided emphasis on a particular science impoverishes science as a whole. The unity of all knowledge is an ideal. Even classification is a provisional attempt to translate this ideal into reality from a particular point of view and in terms of a particular intellectual and historical situation. To that extent, every scheme is false. Academic departments. No single principle governs the organization of disciplines at a university. No one man has planned this classification with the knowledge of the whole picture in mind as in the case of industrial division of labor. On the contrary, there have arisen a number of separate intellectual movements, each aiming individually at the whole of knowledge. The particular sciences have remained such independent wholes. They do not lie next to one another like the separate drawers of a filing cabinet, but overlap and interrelate without necessarily intermingling. They communicate without blurring into one another, guided by the vision of an infinitely large single body of knowledge. The essence of the university is concerted yet unregimented activity, a life of diversity yet inspired by the ideal of wholeness, the cooperation yet independence of many disciplines. Departmentalization still in use today dates back to the medieval period. The three upper faculties were theology, jurisprudence, and medicine. A fourth or lower faculty was added, the liberal arts, today's philosophical faculty. The meaning of these faculties has changed as the meaning of research has changed. For the last 150 years, the number of faculties has at times been increased, then again reduced to the old number. Today, there are usually five because the old philosophical faculty has been broken into two faculties, one of mathematics and natural sciences, and one of liberal arts. These faculties claim to mirror faithfully the cosmos of sciences. They represent the whole of human knowledge. They arose from the practical needs of intellectual work, not from theoretical schemes of classifying the sciences. The continuing validity of these faculties today, after centuries of radical change in our environment, our knowledge, and our research, attests to the truth of their original conception. Theology, jurisprudence, and medicine cover permanent areas of inquiry understanding of religious revelation, of statute law, both private and public, and of the nature of man. The study of these subjects is meant to train ministers, judges, administrators, and physicians for their practical careers. They all need at least logic and philosophy as a common foundation. The sciences of theology, jurisprudence, and medicine aim for an end in itself no longer scientific, the eternal salvation of the soul, 
the general welfare of people as members of society, and bodily health, respectively. Paradoxically, then, these sciences originate outside the scientific realm. They work with assumptions which, though themselves not scientific, impart substance, meaning, and purpose to science. Theology is concerned with revelation, approached in three ways, through the history of the Holy Scriptures, through the Church, through dogma, and verified in terms of contemporary faith. Jurisprudence is concerned with rationalizing and standardizing statute law as produced and validated by the power of a given state. Medicine is concerned with preserving, fostering, and restoring the health of human beings and is based on an inclusive knowledge of human nature. Each of these scientific disciplines is entirely based on non-scientific premises. Each must seek to shed light on these premises for without them, it loses all meaning, as shown by the following typical phenomena. Theology touches upon the supra-rational realm, but through rational means. Now, instead of rationally developing the meaning of revelation, theology can develop a passion for the absurd. Self-contradiction is then supposed to confirm the very truth of an assertion. The enslavement of reason to confirm the very truth of faith the arbitrary submission to an authority, even though in reality it exists in the world in the form of judgments and expressions, which are supposed to be the true way of life. Brutality, fanaticism, inquisitions, and lovelessness, these make up the theological fury. Conversely, revelation, the basis of faith, may be lost. Faith is then equated with rational doctrine and deduced from reason alone. But as revelation, the historical foundation of faith is lost. Faith itself is lost. Reduced to unrestricted rational thinking, it ends up in unbelief. Jurisprudence bases itself upon the reality of the positive legal order. This order of statute law is to be made meaningful, coherent, and consistent. Natural law, though by no means a fixed standard, provides a guiding idea of what is right or wrong. Without this foundation, jurisprudence sinks into the abyss of total arbitrariness. Statute law, then, is valid simply because it is backed up by state power. Self-contradiction and injustice cease to be valid counter-arguments. Illegality is legally sanctioned, and thought itself bows before the law of force. Conversely, a jurisprudence concerned only with natural law and without any reference to actual statute law becomes meaningless too. Medicine is premised on the will to advance the life and health of all men and as human beings. This ideal admits of no qualification. First and foremost, the desire to help and heal concerns itself with individuals. It concerns large groups only insofar as individuals profit, and no individual is physically harmed. Yet medical interest in health is as ambiguous as the concept of physical health itself. The task of medicine involves conflicting tendencies. It becomes meaningless both where the individual's inalienable right to physical health is abandoned and where the meaning of physical health becomes a convenient but overly simple stereotype. Once a particular racial or physiological type is preferred to man as a whole, a motive exists for doing harm to the life and health of individuals for the supposed benefit of some particular group as a whole. Thus, persons presumed to have large chances of transmitting unfavorable hereditary traits have been forcibly sterilized, and in the name of euthanasia, the mentally ill have been murdered. In the three so-called higher faculties, the ideas of reason, natural law, justice, and life and health are standards indispensable to research, if it is to retain any meaning. But in Revelation, positive law, and human nature, dark powers remain which we can endlessly illuminate, but never fully understand. And it is these that endow research with substance and life. The philosophical faculty enjoys a unique position. Originally, it did not prepare for a specific profession, but prepared solely for the higher faculties, theology, jurisprudence, and medicine. Today, the function of the philosophical faculty has changed from a preparatory to a fundamental one. The philosophical faculty embraces all other branches of knowledge. The three remaining faculties derive their intellectual substance from contact with the basic disciplines comprised in the philosophical faculty, the faculty of arts and sciences. Thus, from the viewpoint of research and theory alone, the philosophical faculty by itself comprises the whole university. Any classification of knowledge which includes everything contained in the philosophical faculty is complete. In the course of the 19th century, the philosophical faculty lost 
both its uniqueness and its unity. It's split up into a faculty of mathematics and natural sciences on the one hand and humanities on the other, from which, in turn, a social science faculty branched off. One came to think of the faculties as existing side by side rather than forming an organic whole. In this way, the idea of the oneness of the university was lost. The university became an aggregate, an intellectual department store. Several motives entered into this split up. The size of the old faculty, which included more professors than all the other three faculties combined. The schism between the natural sciences and the liberal arts, which entailed estrangement, lack of understanding, and mutual disdain. And the need to train people for different professions such as teaching, chemistry, physics, geology, and agriculture. The reunification of the university, which stems from an awareness of the cosmos of the sciences, cannot simply mean restoring things to their medieval unity. The whole content of modern knowledge and research must be integrated. Broadening the scope of the university must initiate a genuine unification of all branches of learning. The expansion of the university. In the modern world, university keeps establishing institutes and teaching organizations designed to meet the changing requirements of society. Thus, areas of specialized technical training or entirely new curricula for professional courses of study require special ways of teaching. Nothing can stop the continuing expansion of the university. This process has meaning because all human activity involves knowledge. Wherever there arises a demand for knowledge, the university is responsible for forging ahead in the new field and teaching it. Not infrequently, the net result was a meaningless aggregate of totally unrelated fields. Astronomy and business administration, philosophy and hotel management find themselves equals in this intellectual department store. To ignore the presence of these newcomers is nothing but useless snobbery. The idea of the university requires that the university be open to new ideas. There is nothing which is not worth knowing about, no art which does not involve a form of knowledge. Only by unifying these various new lines of inquiry can the university do justice to them. The university is called upon to preserve the scientific spirit by transforming and assimilating the new materials and skills and integrating them in the light of a few leading ideas. There are two ways in which the curriculum may be broadened by increasing the number of subjects offered. On the one hand, science differentiates itself in the natural course of its growth. In this process, each new phase remains an integral whole comparable to the propagation of life. In this way, psychiatry as well as ophthalmology achieved an independent status within medicine itself because they developed both subject matter and scientists of universal significance. Conversely, legal medicine does not qualify as an independent field, but it's a collection of technical skills and know-how. Similarly, the status of dental medicine as well as the medicine of ear, nose, and throat is dubious because the organs concerned lack universal implications. These fields lack the overall significance of internal medicine, psychiatry, or ophthalmology. Public health too enjoys a dubious status. Although outstanding representatives of this field have rightly held professorships, the field itself has its practical and technical limitations. It lacks a really challenging idea. The mere fact that people working in the field of public sanitation have made contributions to bacteriology does not suffice to enroll public sanitation in the ranks of the basic sciences. To give detailed answers to the questions raised here, would require further study and expert knowledge in the fields concerned. We are here concerned only with the principle. The split up of sciences into new fields of study is desirable to the extent that a given new field can, in turn, develop into an integral whole in touch with the universal ideas and so remain a basic science. Alternatively, science can grow if new materials and skills enter into it from without. They demand admittance because they can make a valuable contribution to the cosmos of the sciences. Thus, for example, the content of the cultures concerned explains why Indic and Chinese studies are basic sciences. African and prehistoric studies are not. Whenever the university expands, it must keep its sights set on the unity of knowledge, on the daily task of revalidating this unity in two ways. Throughout all change, the university must retain its awareness of the basic sciences and the hierarchy of both of basic as and the hierarchy both of basic as against auxiliary sciences and of instruction through research as against mere factual and technical instruction. 
The expansion of the university is a problem which relates to its very survival in the modern world. New ideas must be recognized and made part of the whole of the university. It is yet to be seen whether the university is equal to the new world, whether it can accept it and serve it, whether the new knowledge of the new abilities can be permeated with the spirit without which they are, strictly speaking, meaningless. Theology, jurisprudence, and medicine, traditionally the three upper faculties, address themselves to areas of human existence that have remained unchanged for thousands of years. Nonetheless, they do not cover the whole of modern existence. This is evident if one considers the large variety of institutions of higher learning which have been founded outside the confines of the university itself, such as technological institutes, agricultural colleges, veterinary colleges, teachers' colleges, schools of business administration, schools of mining, etc. Is their mere existence not proof that the life of the university has failed in important respects? Does not the establishment of these independent institutes violate the idea of the university? It is significant indeed that these establishments tend to duplicate some of the work of the university, and they have a natural tendency to expand into a university so that, for example, we find all the liberal arts, up to and including philosophy, being taught at technical institutes. More often than not, however, even the presence of outstanding scholars in the humanities has not been able to produce anything more than an empty educational routine bereft of the vitality and strength which comes only with creative scholarship. Thus, these scholars frequently feel as exiles. Could it be that there is some connection between the growing emptiness of modern life and this growth of diverse specialized schools? Is there a way which would lead back from the superficiality of specialism, the general aimlessness, the dilemma of diverse special schools, to some new unity? Whatever possibility exists hinges upon the extent to which vast new areas of human life can be incorporated in the university. Medicine, jurisprudence, and theology, the three traditional branches of learning, no longer suffice as they did for the medieval world. Yet progress cannot be achieved by simply increasing the number of departments. One cannot just add a new department whenever a new field has been opened up somewhere on a large scale. Even highly specialized departments must relate to a genuine, important sector of human life. This is not a new idea. In 1803, for example, the logical, the local government established in Heidelberg a department of political economy and incorporated it in temporarily into the philosophical faculty. This department included forestry, urban and rural economics, mining and surveying, civil engineering, architecture, assaying, and police organization. Everything that concerns the knowledge, preservation, development, and proper maintenance of public administration. All that eventually remained of these arts and sciences was what came to be known as economics. Clearly, the department failed to encompass a genuine self-contained sector of human life. The reference to public administration served as a utilitarian catch-all for various unrelated jobs, but failed to provide a unifying ideal. Yet here were the roots of an important later development, which became a factor in the public mind only gradually in the course of the 19th century. This is technology, which, as is becoming ever clearer, is the sole really new field. Although technology is ages old and has developed through thousands of years, until the, eight, until the end of the 18th century, it remained a part of handicraft. Hence, it remained basically unchanged and part of man's daily life within his natural environment. Then, during the last 150 years, technology made an incision deeper than all the events of world history over the past thousands of years, as deep perhaps as that caused by the discovery of tools and of fire. Technology has become an independent giant. It grows and advances. It brings about a unified and planned exploitation of the globe, an exploitation which is financially profitable. Trapped in the spell of technology, men seem no longer capable of controlling what originated in their own works. Technology has a claim to their basic concerns equal in objectivity to that of theology, jurisprudence, and medicine, a claim which was not fully recognized until it compelled our attention amid the catastrophic changes and events of recent history. For it is technology which has now taken over the job of molding man's natural environment, of transforming human life, even as it transforms nature and the technical world. To expand the university by creating a fourth faculty next to the three upper faculties, theology, jurisprudence, and medicine, poses a real challenge. Technology represents an entirely new and developing area of human life. 
Unclear as is the ultimate effect of technology upon human existence, it is involved in a development at once planned and chaotic. We all observe the drastic changes of our immediate environment. Apartment, house, and public building, road construction and traffic management, transportation and communication, the furnishing of kitchen, desk, and bed, the supply of water, gas, and electricity, all of which spell the difference between our modern environment and earlier ones, are held together not only by utilitarian considerations or by the agency of the natural sciences, but by the novel concept of man's transformation of his natural environment. Still, this novel conception of human life and the enormous apparatus dedicated to its maintenance have so far failed to crystallize into a controlled and permanent pattern. The restless march of technological change on a gigantic scale makes us stagger between ecstasy and, be and bewilderment, between the most fabulous power and the most elementary helplessness. Everything seems to flow into the one great stream of technological organization, which for reasons which escape adequate historical understanding began to flow 150 years ago and to this day continues to swell steadily, flooding everything. Today, we feel that this colossal phenomenon must stem from metaphysical sources, that all must accept its objectives at pain of extinction. It seems as if there is something that is bound to awaken even though still half asleep, something that until now has remained silent behind the great mass of ingenious technological devices, something dimly perceived by a few individuals like Goethe and Burkhardt, who reacted to it with a mixture of horror and distaste. Perhaps the best interests of the intellectual life as well as of technology are served by making the university their mutual meeting place. Perhaps then technology and the confusion which has resulted from it would be infused with meaning and purpose. Perhaps, then, out of the idea of the university would grow an openness, truthfulness, up-to-dateness, in which this idea would prove itself. Thus the idea, thus the university would, in effect, be transforming itself. Only a revival of the old idea of the university could make scholars feel the magnitude of their task to the point where the creation of a new, techno of a new technical faculty would benefit the university as a whole but the university as a whole would have to share in this rededication if it is to have a chance of promoting a general rebirth. The university's great task would be to create a truly comprehensive awareness of our age in terms of the sum total of knowledge and practical skills of which the integration of the technical faculty is only one aspect. Along with the incorporation of a school of technology, other changes would become essential. Above all, the old philosophical faculty must be reunified. The division into the natural sciences and the humanities must be overcome. Only reunification can impart sufficient force to the basic theoretical disciplines to counteract the increased impact and scope of the practical disciplines. This reduces the danger that its continued isolation at the university will slowly drive the natural sciences into the camp of technology and medicine, leaving the other faculties to cherish precious memories in aesthetic isolation without vigor and relevance. More than that, it would necessitate reintroducing into the sciences the concept of hierarchy, which distinguishes between basic and auxiliary disciplines. A technical faculty would be something new at the university. It would have to be more than just a new faculty or school. It would have to get the university to do something entirely new. The university must face the great problem of modern man, how out of technology there can arise that metaphysical foundation of a new way of life which technology has made possible. It is impossible to predict which disciplines will provide the strongest impulses to this end once scholars and scientists have begun to realize this task in close and constant intellectual cooperation. Technology is an autonomous discipline which, like any other field, is prone to certain grave and specific errors once it loses sight of its own presuppositions. Thus, theology was shown to be prone to lapse deliberately from the secret of revelation into absurdity and witch-hunting, jurisprudence to lapse from its concern with statute law into legal rationalization of lawless brutality and license, medicine to lapse from its essential duty to heal to euthanasia and the killing of the insane. Similarly, technology either does or does not live up to its ideals. We have heard about inventors who, in their old age, were overcome by horror at the realization of the evil they had unwittingly and indirectly brought about by their discoveries. We have heard about the emptiness of certain kinds of technical work, 
the arbitrary nature of its goals, the pointlessness and mere competence as such. Yet the foundation of all technical activity is the profoundly informed will to develop more fully man's existence in this world. A technical faculty can serve no more than the medical one as a mere annex of the philosophical faculty. It has its own independent area of existence and its own practical task. Still, like medicine, it is grounded intrinsically and pedagogically in the basic sciences which are part of the philosophical faculty. The following are the most immediate consequences of the proposed change. As the university absorbs the Institute of Technology, the need for duplicating physics, chemistry, and mathematics is removed. The history of ideas, history of art, economics, and political science would also become part of the philosophic faculty. The needs of technology would impart fresh life to the philosophic fac faculty as a whole. For the basic disciplines would more consciously focus on the common horizon of theoretical inquiry. Their teaching would be directed to the common problems of medicine, technology, and teaching. It is difficult to say how this will manifest itself in the personality of the individual scholar. Quite possibly, teaching will stress the historical development of science and mathematical insights, and in this way carry over the unity of the philosophical faculty into the individual sciences. All told, both university and technical institutes stand to profit from unification. The university would grow richer, more inclusive, and more modern. Its basic problems would be infused with new life. Conversely, the technological world would become more contemplative as the problem of its meaning becomes a matter of serious concern. Its self-affirmation and its limits, its over-optimism and its tragic disappointments would all be placed in a deeper context. It is increasingly important, however, to recognize the independence and universality of the technical world as a modern phenomenon without drawing the empty conclusion that a great many other departments are warranted by the same token. In no case can the study of agriculture, forestry, business administration, etc. be considered as faculties of equal status with the technological faculty. These are specialties, pure and simple, without a truly comprehensive subject. Still, they must not be excluded from the university. The university is free to teach whatever is teachable, provided it distinguishes sharply between research subjects and auxiliary subjects, such as those mentioned above. Research subjects cover disciplines whose content and level of achievement merit incorporation into the university itself. Itself. The other group of subjects does not merit incorporation, but affiliation only to the university, at least for the time being. Their teachers and students will work in the atmosphere and framework of the university without belonging to it in the narrower sense. The university faculty member differs from the teacher of affiliated subjects like agriculture, business administration, etc., in that he is judged not only on his teaching performance, but on the merit of his self-directed research. The faculty member engaged in research differs from his technical assistant in that he is concerned with the basic problems and their meaning. The technical assistant limits himself to the collection of facts, auxiliary work, and certain well-defined preliminary objectives. A higher education is a prerequisite for an ever-growing number of jobs. We have the choice of either ignoring this need from a misplaced and unrealistic sense of caste, or else of doing something to help meet it. If we choose the second path, carefully and step by step, as is only reasonable, the difficult question arises whether there really is a long-run need at the university for isolated service skills. We have to decide if our common interests are really served by specialized intellectual techniques, a kind of second-order manual labor, a mere routine efficiency without a corresponding vision of the whole, or if this is pernicious in the long run, even though, for the time being at least, we must learn to put up with it. Does the university embody the aspirations of all men, and is it therefore called upon ultimately to accept all applicants and to elevate to a higher level each and every branch of human knowledge and technique, or does it contain an esoteric element, forever intelligible, only to a minority. We must not allow ourselves to be deceived by the inevitable demands of those who oppose the idea of intellectual hierarchy. Their claims are premature. Equality of intellectual status cannot be decreed. It can only be earned through patient and individual effort and growth. Nor must we be deceived by the dream that all people can achieve the noblest function of humanity. This is a utopian dream which, that is not realized simply by assuming that it exists already when, in fact, no one knows or is capable of knowing to what extent it can be realized. A temporary solution is that the university set up schools which are affiliated with but not actually part of the university. 
the university must maintain its aristocratic principles if it is not to fall prey to a universal low airing of standards. The actual incorporation of affiliated schools into the university is not a matter of decree. It can only be accomplished by allowing these schools to grow into intellectual maturity in their own way. If this is done, then the actual incorporation is no more than a formal recognition of an accomplished fact. Thank you for listening to this audio recording by David McCarricker, published by Theory Underground. This work has been placed in the public domain because of its importance. I hope that you all enjoy this during your holidays in its small daily doses, like an advent calendar. And that if you are intrigued to hear lectures on the topic of the idea of the university, then I hope you will consider joining the course that I am leading with Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, the three of us, all educators, interested in the idea of higher education and a kind of learning environment that cares about the freedom of individuals to be able to research what they find most interesting as opposed to what big business or political partisans think you ought to be researching. I'm going to actually show you all really quick what the website looks like. So you go to theory-underground.com. Make sure to register with the website and then go to courses right here. You can also go to events and get to it that way. And then right here you see Mikey teaches Zizek for they know not what they do. That's a class that kicks off in February. We also have professional managerial class consciousness that's kicking off at the end of January. And I'm teaching that one with Elton. And then the idea of the university right here. All three of these are courses that you can add to your shopping cart and choose to take if you want. But the idea of the university, if you click on it, if you're not already logged in, then this is what you should see. Click take this course, click add to cart, view cart, and then proceed to checkout. Oh, one quick thing, don't forget, I guarantee the verification email will be sent to your spam folder. So if you're going, I tried to sign up with their website, I registered and everything, I just didn't never get the, I never got the email, uh, don't worry. It's in your spam folder. You just have to find it, and you might not be able to find it from your phone. You might have to actually sit down at a laptop. I'm sorry, it's not always as easy as giant mega corporations make it when you try to do stuff underground. So go for it, try it out. Let me know if it works. Okay, bye. So anyway, that's how you do it. I hope to see you there in the discussions on the Zoom chat, but also in the forums where the real conversation will hopefully be taking place on the website. Anyway, everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Take care.